Okay, it looks like we are up now. YouTube froze on me and just kept saying it would not accept anything. So... Now we're getting it set up again, kind of where we're at. Sorry about that. Stuff happens. We're kind of at the mercy of this program, which now this isn't going. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if my internet has died or what. Here we go. Well, we'll see if this works. I believe we got right to here when I quit last time, and so that's where we'll get going again. Okay, a couple announcements. It looks as though the AP exam is going to happen, and Oop, I got to get one more thing squared away. It looks like the AP exam is going to happen, and it's going to be two different dates that I haven't come up with. It's going to be online, which I'm not sure what that means, and relatively short. So my guess is it would just be short answer questions. And it appears as though everything is off. Okay, so it would just be short answer questions. And and let me do this real quick. Let me make sure everybody knows this is on. I don't know what the deal is. I'm a little bit annoyed by this, but that's the way things go. So you get to watch the creative process here. It's really exciting, I agree. Nothing's ever easy. You gotta hit like five different buttons to get it to switch to one channel. It's just, uh, I guess that's the way life is. Okay, so back to the AP exam. So those of you watching this, the AP exam will be on sometime in May, and it's supposedly gonna end around 1945 is the era, which the assumption is that we have gone through 1945 by March. And which will work out okay for us, but I have no idea what the rest of the exam will be. It's probably going to be short IDs. I am going to give you a review packet. I've been kind of holding off on that. Normally, I would have given it to you two weeks ago. And I give you a significant amount of credit, a lot of points, like two test scores, to do this review packet. So I'm going to redo it, and I should hopefully have it by tomorrow. I'll have it up as an assignment that will be due the day after or the day before the AP exam. We'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there on the exact date of the test, but it will be due in May. And so I'll get that out to you. And that will be basically the only real assignment over spring break, except for I'm gonna give you a week to do three short answer questions for the New Deal. So I'm just gonna give you a full week to do them and do them properly, and that means to do them correctly, you have to have been able to uh, watch my notes and get what I've said in class. So that's the first thing about the AP exam. Uh, the second, second thing is I uh, have to do it by hand the the scores from the movies and the extra credit so as soon as I get that done I'll get that in the grade book and the program changes grades I don't really understand how it works and so or why it does that it, it's gone and so if it makes a change let me know and I'll go back to it and also since I have to kind of jerry rig things if I type it wrong let me know and I'll get the right grade in. next <laughs> next it's not like I, I have a list here Make sure you're keeping up with this. When I ask questions about this for the exam, when I do the short answer questions, you know, this is what I'm gonna expect you to know. It's what I talk about here. 
and if you just look at my PowerPoints, all it gives you are bullet points, and that won't give you enough. And if you look in your review book or your textbook, sure, they're good supplements, they give you a lot of material, but not enough to really understand what's going on here. And so with that, just make sure you keep up with what I do, and if it doesn't appear like you are, I will turn this into an assignment that you have to uh, show me pictures of your notes. I don't really want to do that right now, but um, you have to make sure you're watching and keeping up. And so we'll go from there. We went through the Emergency Banking Act, Fireside Chats, CCC, FARA, NRA. And if you have any questions, please type, in, type it in the live chat. I will be a little bit late on that, but I'll get it as soon as I can. And let me do this really quick. I have to get one more screen up. Sorry. I just have to move this here. All right. They don't make this thing easy, but I have to be able to see both screens here. Okay. And so we're right here on the NRA. And one thing I did talk about, uh, different reactions to the New Deal and the causes of the Great Depression. And one thing has just happened. The Senate last night voted for a massive $2 trillion. And I just want you to wrap your mind around that. $2 trillion dollar. Uh, appropriations bill, which means which means a spending bill, to help with this economic crisis that's going right now, and the economic crisis is very real. 3.3 million people just uh, apply for unemployment insurance. That means we have millions of people who have lost their jobs, not getting a paycheck, and more importantly, and think about this at a time of the pandemic, they don't have insurance, or at least are losing their insurance. We don't have national health care, and so this is a a real crisis for people who don't have a job and don't have insurance through their through their employer and are unable to get on for whatever reason on the very limited government program of Medicaid for low-income people and the big thing about that is we are in a pandemic and if people aren't getting health care they are spreading the disease and the disease is bad over half the cases are people under 50 and there's this belief and it's foolish that people under 50 aren't dying well, yes, they, they are, and people are getting sick. They are going through hell, and it's very unequal. Some people get it worse than others, and this is a real issue, and that reminds me, as I see my postman drive up, uh, thank those people who are still delivering and working at, at restaurants or working at, at grocery stores or your your mail carriers or your or especially the healthcare workers you know they're out there working and risking themselves to help you those are the those people deserve our thanks I, especially those who are every day potentially putting their their life at risk and don't forget it's not just them if they work cuz they have to work and they're doing necessary jobs if they spread it it can go to other people now let's get back really quick to the senate bill the senate bill We'll give a little bit of additional aid for workers and people. Probably not enough, as they found out in 2008, as they found out during the first New, first New Deal, etc. But the other thing is, it's pretty remarkable. They're going to give basically a slush fund to the Department of the Treasury of $500 billion to give to, to big corporations. These are not small businesses. These are the really big ones who just got a massive tax cut two years ago. And the big thing about that is, the big thing is, that 500 billion is not just 500 billion. That will be used as seed money, collateral, to get up to over four trillion dollars in loans from the Federal Reserve. So this is a massive government aid for big business. And the reason I'm telling you this is, this fits in very well with with um, trickle down economics. And you can see a connection. This is the same idea. If we have an economic problem. We got to help those who produce. So there's all kinds of conditions for working people or small business in this bill. All kinds of conditions. That money, they can do whatever they want. They can fire workers. They can give themselves a raise. They can build themselves a gold-gilded carriage or increase production. There's no conditions. So that's where we're at right now. So let's get back to this. 
So we got through the first new deal, but there's a few more laws we have to get to. One of them is the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the AAA. Remember alphabet soup? And the thing about the Agricultural Adjustment Act is the farm crisis was, well, it's become a catastrophe. As you can see this in 1933, there were almost 6,000 farm foreclosures. And here's Roosevelt. There, there's been a lot of plans. And actually, Hoover had some decent ideas. The AAA was a pretty good idea. It was not supposed to come up all at the same time, but it would stabilize farm prices. How did they do this? The big problem was overproduction. So it would literally pay farmers not to grow. It would pay them not to grow. They would tax producers, uh, those who manufacture food, whatever it might be, canners, whatever. And the farmers would not grow, and therefore they would not starve. Yet at the same time, these farmers would uh, be storing their food or not growing food. And then when the prices went up again, they would start growing again. And they could take advantage of the higher prices, but still be able to pay back their debts when they weren't growing. And then when prices began to drop again because of overproduction, then it would pay farmers gradually not to grow. And it had some pretty good effect. As you can see from that chart, it went down dramatically. I'll get to the waste in a second, but it did not get to sharp sharecroppers. And the reason why was pure, unadulterated racism. Southern Democrats, remember, there was only the Democratic Party in the South. They made it very clear that this should not go to sharecroppers because the vast majority of sharecroppers, sharecroppers were African Americans. And let's be clear about this. The vast majority of African American farmers were sharecroppers. There were a significant number of white sharecroppers too, so they didn't care about the poor white farmers either. This was classist, but also racist. Remember, class and race always go hand in hand. This goes back to Bacon's Rebellion. But it would be found unconstitutional four years later. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But I gotta quit saying that. Let's get back to the waste. The problem was in 33, Farm prices were tanked, farm foreclosures were going up, and they had to do something now. So the decision was made in the Department of Agriculture, and looking back, this decision is so stupid that they should destroy the surplus crop. And so they took out millions of bushels of, of wheat, over 50,000, or burned it, over billions of bushels of corn, and just burned it. Something like 5 billion bushels or um, bushels of oranges were literally thrown into San Francisco Bay. And they put armed guards around the docks to make sure that poor people did not swim out to grab an orange. So they would destroy the oranges. They butchered and burned 50,000 pigs and over 100,000 cows. Innumerable numbers of chicken. The idea is to get rid of the overproduction. And this is unbelievable. They destroyed food at a time where people were literally starving in their food riots. This would taint the New Deal for its entire time as being wasteful. Now, the reason they're thinking is we got to get rid of production or get rid of overproduction. So we get rid of the surplus and prices will go up and farmers will be saved. Now, I think you can see the problem. If they're starving people, what do you do? If they give the food to the people who are starving, if they give them the food, prices will continue to be low. And the solution would have been to simply give farmers and people money. And that would have alleviated the problem of the farmers' low prices in that era, at that moment, and solve the problem of people not being able to afford the food. But because of social Darwinism was so prevalent, they, they couldn't, they knew they couldn't pass through a bill that would give money directly to, to unemployed people and to, and to poor farmers, which is ironic because there were a number of bills, especially the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, that directly gave money to the wealthy. And I repeat, that's why I talked about that Senate bill that passed last night today. There's no conditions on giving money to big corporations and therefore the millionaires and billionaires that run the corporation. Let's be clear about that. That's who does it. But there's all kinds of conditions on working people and small businesses. Well, they don't know how to work. They're not, they were wasted or frankly, we just want our money. And so the Agricultural Adjustment Act had some effect, but you're going to see a big push of sharecroppers off the farm as the landlords got the money and they kept it. So there's the AAA. 
Another important bill was the Tennessee Valley Authority. And this would dam much of the Tennessee and Cumberland uh, River Valleys. And that map I showed you shows most of the Tennessee Valley region. This is area of a lot of flooding. This would irrigate the, the crop land, build or create millions of jobs building these dams. But one of the biggies is electricity. This would provide electrical power to people all over the South. And another thing that went hand in hand in this was the REA, the Rural Electrification Administration, which would pay for or provide funding for government and private cooperations to provide electricity to areas, rural areas all over the United States. This was huge in Montana. And there are still REA um, co-ops, as they're called, cooperatives, that run electrical facilities in, let's say, around the Great Falls area. And the whole thing was that to get electricity and therefore the modern era to areas that have been left behind to provide people with a better life and with jobs. The TVA still exists and was in some way shockingly successful, even though there are some problems with it. Nobody realized the environmental impact of dams, maybe not real, realize is the wrong word, cared. The thought was this was progress. And the dams are silting up and there are some issues with silt getting in and clogging the turbines. We talked about electric dynamos before, but that's the TVA. And this is one of Roosevelt's proudest accomplishments, that in the RA, providing electricity to people that he truly felt, felt were being left behind. I should add that when he was getting the treatment in Warren Springs, Georgia, he called it the treatment for his, what well, everyone thought was polio, he would drive around Georgia and talk to farmers, talk to people there, and uh, learned about how hard their life was and how they felt left behind by government. And this would be personified in the memorial, the FDR memorial that would be built in the 1990s in Washington, D.C. He did not want a memorial, but there eventually be one if you get to Washington, D.C. It is my favorite memorial, memorial there. Um, well, Lincoln's pretty good. <laughs> but uh, there's a big section of, essentially shows the steps of a water flowing down like this waterfall, but it's supposed to represent the steps of a dam. And it's a, a really moving moment. He was so proud of this. This and Social Security. So the TVA. Another one was direct regulation of banks, the Glass-Steagall bill. And it looks kind of small, but put big asterisks by it, underline it, box it. This is one of the most important bills in American history. The Glass-Steagall bill. These are two of the main founders of the bill. But Roosevelt's encouragement most certainly got this passed. And this would do a number of things. First off, it would create the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And this, any banks that entered it and paid due, you got to pay a fee for your insurance. This would protect deposits today up to $400,000 or $250,000, for $400,000. depends on the, on the type of loan. But it would insure most deposits. So even if the bank went under, 99% of bank deposits would be protected. And banks that enter the system they must come under the regulation of the FDIC. So if the banks cannot make risky loans, the banks cannot, or they begin to show a reserve problem where they're not, they don't have enough money on stock, the FDIC can literally take over the bank and sometimes even resell it to other banks, uh, resell it to another conglomerate or another group that's trying to create a corporation to create a banks, create banks. This had an amazing effect on banks. Once this came in, people realized their deposits were safe and ended the problem of bank panics, which remember, bank panics would start in banks that shut down, then ripple to banks that were supposedly relatively secure. And that picture shows the number of bank failures from 21 to 50. And look at the New Deal and look how many you know, 9,000 banks crashed when the banks um, from the new um, from the stock market crash to FDR's election, and then look what happened afterwards. Virtually no bank failures. Some of these regulations would, re, would be removed in what's called the thrift industry or savings and loans in 1980. There was a big increase in bank failures. And some of the restrictions were lifted in 2008. There were a small number of bank collapses, but the FDIC saved 
well, saved the, the world from financial disaster in 2008 and is undoubtedly saving it right now. People know that their banks are relatively safe, even though banks are in real trouble right now because people can't pay back their loans right now. Remember I talked about liquidity trap and debt deflation that's happening right now. That's part of the reason why the stock market went up is because once they realized we're gonna get this big bailout, um, even though we were doing a, even though corporations were doing a bunch of things to profit from their tax cuts, once they realized that people thought, oh, well, the government will bail out our stocks, we will be fine. This is trickle, this is trickle down economics. But another important part is investment banks were separated from commercial banks. And this was so important, just a sec. No questions. I have to see something very quickly. Hmm. This did not work. I know I got 10 concurrent views and you to watch me check my screen. This is so exciting. Okay, so with that, Investment banks are banks that invest in finance, so speculation. They help companies create corporations. These are the banks. The, this is what you think about when you think of Wall Street banks, like Goldman Sachs today. And they used to be part of commercial banks. Commercial banks are what you think about banks, the bank down the street. So like Valley Bank or Stockman's Bank. They make home loans, car loans, maybe small business loans. But the big thing is they're the ones you put your savings in. And the FDIC only insures commercial banks. Well, before the New Deal, investment banks and commercial banks were separate, or I'm sorry, were part of the same banks. And the investment section were taking money from, from people's savings and using that to loan to people for risky speculation. And so that was separate. So they could not use the two and therefore investment in speculation would not be insured by the FDIC, only commercial banks. And these two parts of Glass-Eagle, there are other parts about regulation, but these are the parts we care about for here, would make sure there'd be no financial panics, none, from 1933, and that's when the Great New Deal ended, so we could argue essentially 1929 to 33, that financial panic, all the way, all the way until 2008, no financial panics. So when I was your age, the idea of a financial panic would have been weird. People did not even know about it. You've been through two. We're going through one right now. And the reason why in 2000, during a conservative trend, it's called, it was called neoliberalism for Democrats under President Bill Clinton, who was a Democrat, but very conservative economics, they got rid of that requirement. And it took them eight years to destroy the world's financial system. So... But FDIC was still there and it saved. It saved pretty much uh, the, the, um, the United States from finan complete financial ruin. So FDR, once again, I guess, saved things. Another thing was the Securities and Exchange Commission, and this would regulate the stock market. So regulate the stock market. Regulate the stock market. Securities, those are stocks and bonds. And what it demanded was transparency. Companies had to tell the truth about their stock values. They couldn't get secret deals. We call insider trading to people to make money. The whole idea is that they must put real numbers out for their earnings. Now, this only works if there is, there's regulation and they're all, it's incredible how many ways to get around the transparency rules. Many of those came about in the late 1990s in deregulation. If you want to blow your head up, go look and see how derivatives function in something called credit default swaps, which still happen today. But anyways, the whole idea was to regulate the stock market. And there was no real stock market crash, big one, from the new, from 30, well, <laughs> the 30s, all the way to 1987, when they started to deregulate the stock market. So those are two big financial ones. And next one. Maybe one of the most important was ending the gold standard. Now, Roosevelt want, knew the United States had to get off the gold standard. This is one of the things that Hoover tried to, to hamstring Roosevelt to get Roosevelt to swear he would not get off the gold standard while he was president-elect. And then Hoover would lie about what he did after the fact. But Roosevelt, in 1933, got off the gold standard. And this allowed the Federal Reserve to inflate the currency, meaning to drop the value of money. There's deflation. Prices are dropping. 
This allowed the Federal Reserve to pump money into the economy. And it allowed for people to pay back their debts because they're paying back their debts of money of lesser value and started getting prices up. This had immediate effect on the economy. This, this graph shows five different countries, um, their GDP, um, their approximate rate of growth of their GDP. It has 1929 as the base level or 100. And you see everybody going down with the Great Depression. And you'll notice once they got off the gold standard, the US, Germany especially, Britain, and especially Japan, their economy boomed. Now they did other things too, and that's important. The US still was reluctant to totally pump up the economy. There's still a lot of called hard money people. You'll notice France did not. France stayed on the gold standard, and this would dramatically affect their ability to meet the threat of Nazi Germany in 37, 38, 39, because their economy was still stagnant and there was a shortage of money and high debt. So the US, in, after World War II, would kind of go back on the gold standard. There was an agreement called Bretton Woods. And this would go all the way to 1971 when President Nixon announced the country would totally go off the gold standard. And that's where we are today. And that allows the Federal Reserve to alter the money supply in good or bad times. and this really has somewhat alleviated the threat of panic because they realize that more money or just having more money out there does not necessarily lead to inflation is what they originally thought it led to inflation more money out there it only matters if people are spending it and you know like right now people aren't spending then people weren't spending this was a huge move getting off the gold standard there's still people today many of them are members of the senate it's more of a conservative ideal to go back on the gold standard because it does create deflation. And also, for people who don't understand, it sounds good. Gold is stable. Actually, no, gold's pretty unstable. Another big thing he did, which was not necessarily a new law, was antitrust. And here's Roosevelt carrying on tr the tradition of his cousin, the trust buster, Teddy Roosevelt. So they wanted to enforce the Sherman Antitrust Act. They also added a couple improvements. And the, remember the Clinton Antitrust Act during the Wilson administration. But the big thing was also using the Federal Trade Commission to actively stop mergers from becoming monopolies, from punishing companies to use monopoly power to stifle the market, to raise rates, to raise prices, to, to drive competitors out. The whole idea was using these two things, this would encourage competition by getting rid of monopolies. And... This would allow for more smaller companies to enter the marketplace. This increased wages because now you have small companies competing for workers. And this would lead to, therefore, less concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a few. So they actively, aggressively enforce antitrust. Uh, antitrust. And this would be America, the, the policy of the United States until the late 1970s, early 1980s with uh, the emergence of a more conservative government. So this is what we would call liberal, as FDR called it, liberal economics antitrust. I should add that we are very, 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 very conservative when it comes to antitrust today, as you can see from the bill just passed last night, which is specifically designed to give more money to the hands of the few corporations. And there's no strings attached. So they are almost certainly going to buy out competitors that are distressed in this bad economic time and increase concentration of power. So that goes against what Roosevelt did. I like that uh, cartoon I found. The results of the first New Deal was an immediate boost in, in, uh, in confidence in the economy. It was amazing how this happened. And here's the idea of Roosevelt, you know, handing out these the cards or like new programs, new ideals. And the economy did grow, grow. as you can see from this picture. It shows the crash at the bottom, so the bottom, it's hard to get my finger at the right spot, bottom 32, 33, and then immediate increase, but it wasn't quite big enough. It did change, have great effect on the economy, but not enough. And no questions yet? Good. Well, good. I, you can ask questions. And I know I go fast, and it's really hard to tell. Okay, I always go fast. But it's really hard to tell when there's no one in front of me. I'm talking to a camera and looking at a screen. It's a little weird. Uh, I, I, you, I start to realize how hard it is to be an actor. You know, we all have to act sometimes. It's part of my job. But still, it's, uh, it's kind of weird. 
it did not grow fast enough. Unemployment was still very high, as you can see from this. Now, they used to then record unemployment two different ways. The blue line is called unadjusted. The purple, violet line, that is, they called it adjusted, but they did not count workers who got jobs through government programs. And and they do now, but that dramatically decreased unemployment. As you can see by 34, unemployment was dropping, but not fast enough. And depression means long-term high unemployment. And government can reach kind of a scary, uh, where's my mouse? Let me get to this pointer. A scary kind of equilibrium. I wanted this pointer back, as you can see right there. I should do that more often. But we have to get to one thing really fast. This is a little bit wrong. It's, it's kind of simple-minded, but it's something that came about after the New Deal. Historians have used it, but more importantly, this is something they have brought up in the AP exam. It's called the three R's. And the idea was that the New Deal programs focused on three different ways to get the country out of the economy. The first one was relief. And so things like the CCC or FARA, laws like that that provide direct short-term drops, direct money to people to, bri to, to provide immediate relief from the Great Depression. And, oh, there's a question. Uh, the first one, let's go back. I got a question. Let's go back to, I'll come back to that. I promise I will. But hey, the question is a little behind. Just deal with it. So the reason they only insured commercial banks was that investment banks were involved with speculation. And so that's gambling on the stock market. And so because of that, they didn't want in, to insure gambling. They only want to insure the savings accounts of working people. And so that's why they did that. The idea would be that would encourage stability. But at the same time, if investments aren't insured, that would discourage too risky of an investment. If they insure investment or speculation, that will encourage speculators to make more risky investments because they know whatever they do, the government will come bail them out. And that's exactly what's going to happen in 1999 through today. And I should add, we're going to get to the election of 1936, but the feeling towards the New Deal was for the vast majority of people was incredibly popular, but there were enemies. So we got to those two things. Sorry, I, I got to keep my um, eyes on those things. Let's get back to this. Re relief. So that is quick short-term relief. Where's my mouse? There we go. There, I have a better view of it now. Oops, I don't have a better view. Sorry, it's a little bit weird doing all this. When I'm looking at three different screens, I know you don't sympathize with me at all. I sympathize with me. Okay, there we go. So, relief for short-term bills to get the people out of the immediate pain of this. The second was recovery. And that's the idea then to get the economy going. So I put that, you know, stimulating agriculture industry, et cetera. So one of the biggies where the NRA was an attempt of that, but the biggest would be the WPA, which we'll get to just a little bit later. And lastly, reform. So reform were long-term things like Social Security or the SEC or especially Glass-Steagall. And these two to reform the economy to make sure this doesn't happen again. So relief are relatively short term with the idea being as the economy gets better, there'll be less need for direct relief. Then recovery to get the economy rolling again. And these, these bills would eventually phase back as the economy gets better. And then reform to keep it from happening. And then the idea being if there's been a depression, boom, relief, recovery, reform. And so almost all the bills fit under these. So, so recovery, you know, the, the recovery, the emergency banking bill. Uh, recovery would be the AAA, but also that would be a reform. But the big reforms were things like Glass-Steagall, SEC, Social Security. Speaking of that, my mailman pulled up, but he just dropped off his mail. So that's good. So a couple more things we have to get to really quick. Eleanor, Re I about said Eleanor Rigby. I, I was listen listening to the Beatles earlier. Eleanor Roosevelt, President Roosevelt's wife, because 
Well, first off, she was a brilliant person. You know, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt was smart. Eleanor, and, uh, brilliant. And very much involved in the New Deal. She became the spokesperson. She went all around the country. She did a radio show. She did newspaper columns. She did interviews. And some people called her the conscience of the New Deal, meaning that she tried to represent those being left behind, the poor, the workers. And I love that picture of all those young people who are so happy to meet Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, I, I'm not going to lie, I very much admire Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, I very much admire Eleanor Roosevelt. And she was a tireless fighter of civil rights. Uh, at a time when Roosevelt was sympathetic towards civil rights, but not as much as, as he would like because he had to get this coalition of Southern Democrats who were intensely racist. You know, they had no problem with giving aid. Well, a lot of them didn't have a problem with giving aid to poor whites, but certainly not others. And hey, a message just came up on the screen, but uh, I just got a question. Are we doing these steps right now? Mm, a, a little bit. There's a little bit on recovery. You see that with um, increasing or, and relief with a $1,200 check that's going to go to everybody making under $75,000 a year. So most workers. Uh, so a small little bit to put money into people's hands, a little bit of aid for small business, and increased unemployment insurance, which was a big deal. In fact, that was a, a big issue that... Uh, um, um, Bernie Sanders demanded last night. I guess it was a pretty dramatic moment on the floor of the Senate. But, but most of the aid is going to big corporations. Uh, in fact, <laughs> it's going to the very wealthy. So they're not, they're doing, it's not the same. Their idea of relief and recovery is to help the very big business so then they can spur economic growth. Or build gold gilded toilet seats. You know, they can do whatever they want with the money. We're just pumping money into their hands. But back to this. Roosevelt would fight for civil rights and I, I love I love those pictures of Roosevelt talking. This map shows all the different areas that she went through around the country. And she I and she went to more than that, but for some reason she took the then it was the Burlington route into Laurel. And I'm just fascinated. What about Laurel? But she went all over the country spreading the word about the New Deal. And here are two letters, and I know they might be hard to read, so let me read both. She got thousands of letters from people who were desperate to try to help with um, economic growth. And one letter uh, from a 17-year-old girl, I've heard you've been very good to the poor, and I'm writing this letter to see if you can help me. I had to leave school because I didn't have any clothes to wear. I would be very thankful to you if you can gather some of these clothes sizes 18 to 20. And talks about her size and she doesn't have a dress or a weather coat. And it ends with, please do not have this letter published in any way as I'm writing this unknown to my parents. And that is such a sad letter, but she got thousands of these. I am I am now, but it misspellings. I mean, you're supposed to, it says now, no, but now. 15 years old and in the 10th grade, I've always been smart but never had a chance as all of us is so poor. I hope to complete my education, but I have to quit schools because I guess there are no clothes can be bought. Don't think that we are on the relief. And it, these letters, she would send to Harry Hopkins in charge of Farah, and it, it, this always kind of uh, chokes me up. This is a you know, real people at help, and Eleanor Roosevelt became the voice that they would listen to, or that the government would listen to, uh, that Roosevelt would listen to. She's a, a pretty amazing person, and, you know, these are people, and I like these letters, all right, or your age, I'm much older. And one of the most important moments, of the idea of our fighting tirelessly for civil rights and against, for example, one in the anti-lynching bill, was in 1939, Marian Anderson, this fantastic singer, was going to sing um, in front of, to give a, a concert in Washington, D.C., but she couldn't because it was segregated due to Jim Crow laws. And so Eleanor Roosevelt got her to sing a concert in 1939 in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And look at the crowd, and, and you see the reflecting pond. So let's hope this sound works. By the way, I should... 
Okay, don't forget the recording process is a little bad. This is from the newsreel film, and I love this little bit of her singing. What an appropriate song to sing. And this bad thing, oh, it's just a, she's just singing. It's sometimes you need symbols of what is right. And this brought out that we are segregated in the, in the federal capitol, and she has to sing in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And this was not allowed until Eleanor Roosevelt's personal interference, interjection into this. I like that. So, while saying that, there were significant enemies of Franklin Roosevelt. Enemies of him all over. And almost immediately, once he was elected, there were groups of people that thought, we can't have him. We can't have. These three I'll show you in just a second. And I did not want this to come out all at once. So I am going to insert something. Yes, you get to watch, once again, the creative process. How did this not work? I didn't click. Nah. Okay, back to this again. Enemies of FDR. Okay. So, a uh, conservative, or right wing, conservatives feared and hated him, especially some of the richest people in America. They were terrified that he was a communist. I mean, the, the thought was he, remember the whole thing about bomb throwing anarchists, etc. And so, Roosevelt was this communist going over the country. They hated, oh, they began a plot. Well, we'll get to the rest of the hatred, but there was, they, many of the wealthiest people in America began to initiate a plot to overthrow FDR. And they were going to overthrow him do it in a way that appeared to be part of the constitutional process, but to create a dictatorship. And they greatly, and oh, the leaders of this were part of what's called the American Liberty League. And this American Liberty League, which started during the, the World War I to root out communists who were opposed, and socialists who were opposed to the war, they're violently anti-union. They begin to organize themselves to overthrow and their hero what they wanted was benito mussolini the fascist in fact he came up with the term fascist dictator in Mussol in in italy and mussolini was able to take power technically under the italian constitution created a dictatorship that was intensely pro-business in fact he called mussolini called his government a corporate state and he greatly admired, or um, he, this corporate state, pro big business, and broke up labor unions, made sure that the very wealthy could do pretty much anything he wanted, and cloaked this in intense nationalism. So they wanted a Mussolini. Now, how Mussolini did it is in 1922, his followers, almost all veterans of World War I, were called black shirts. And they were this quasi paramilitary group that wore black uniforms and they would battle communists in the streets of Rome. And they got their money from some of the wealthiest people in Italy who are violently anti-communist. And so they thought this plot, the American Liberty League, how do we emulate the Bonus Army? The Bonus Army in 32 was this march on Washington, D.C. Let's get that and let's get the most decorated U.S. soldier who spoke at the Bonus Army, he was in that video, A Road to Rock Bottom. We will get him to lead it, and he will be our figurehead, General Smedley Butler. And Butler will march this now well-equipped, well-uniformed army of veterans following the Bonus Army to Washington, D.C., and demand protection for workers. And they will march on the Capitol and force Roosevelt to give power to Butler. Then this is separate, like, uh, um, Secretary of the Homeland, which is kind of weird to think about today, who would take power. And Butler then would run the government for some of the richest people in the world. And I put the names up there. Cunningham and Lane were descendants of two very wealthy oil and finance families. And then 
I, I mispronounce his name, but it, I want to say Irene, but it's Irene. I think it's Irene A. Uh, DuPont from the DuPont family, which um, chemicals. They made their mon their billions on chemicals. Still a very wealthy family today. So these are three of the representatives of the richest families in the world. But uh, there was uh, a couple of the Rockefellers were involved. Henry Ford was sympathetic. A lot of people got money and they went to Butler. Now Butler, who's in that picture above with the Marine Corps symbol behind them, he was the most white, the, the most decorated U.S. soldier in history up to that time. And they went to Butler and asked him this. And Butler heard them out and walked away. And they thought they had Butler. They made a number of, uh, of um, ways to try to get Butler to do, to do this in the fall of 1933. Now, they did not understand Butler. They assumed everybody could be bought. You give people money and they'll do anything, even though Butler talked out against them. Butler despised those people. He got his medals during big stick diplomacy leading Marines to take over governments. And in fact, he was in Nicaragua and involved in small fights there. A couple little excursions into Guatemala and Honduras, in Cuba and in Dominican Republic. And he despised them. In fact, he wrote a book that he said um, um, that, that he was a gangster for big American banks. And he immediately went to President Roosevelt. And this terrified Roosevelt, who had no idea they were actually considering doing this. And Roosevelt uh, didn't know what to do. Do you call him out? Because if they call him out, he was worried that this would give ammunition to people who thought communism was, or capitalism the people thought capitalism was completely flawed. This would give them all sorts of ammunition, all sorts of ammunition uh, to overthrow the government. And so he decided, I think looking back, probably incorrectly, he should have these people pilloried and arrested, but he just let it out that we know you did it. And that is a, for the newsreel, Smedley Butler talking about it, but not mentioning name. Well, DuPont and Lane fled the country. All these people took off running away. When they realized they weren't going to be arrested, they came back. And Wash uh, Roosevelt made it very clear, I'm watching and this can't happen again. Let me check and make sure the sound is okay. Yep, you can hear me in the background. Okay. But there was a plot to, to bring fascism to the United States, and it very well could have worked. And this fits in with their, for the most part, their love of fascism. And and they remained in opposition and there were a couple other threats, but there was always this lingering fear of a fascist government coming in, which without a doubt could happen today. And also more generic, right-wing pro-business conservatives always hated him and here a couple different reasons but they hated labor unions and they hated the progressive taxes and they hated that roosevelt was taking all this power and see that holding more power from congress and here um also they hated the idea of no aid for the poor they were social darwinistic to their point of view, you help the poor and they'll quit working. In fact, that was the argument last night by six Republicans who were opposed to increase unemployment insurance for people who were laid off because of the coronavirus. They said, if you give people unemployment insurance, it will hurt them and they'll quit working, which uh, is the very conservative point of view towards that. Um, they wanted no government regulation at all. They said he was a communist, a socialist, as you can see from that cartoon right there. And they wanted more trickle down. They wanted the gold standard. So the whole point about it is, is that they feared the inflation. They thought that socialist was coming in. And, and so they poured millions of dollars, unprecedented amount of money into Republicans in 1936 election and 38 and 40, etc. And some of the richest people in the world, they looked to Roosevelt, richest people in the United States, as a traitor 
to his class and talked about this over and over again. You're one of us. How can you do programs against us? And this hatred would go on for years. So the vast majority of people would love Roosevelt and have their pictures on their walls. But so many despised him. And in fact, let me get to one thing, real, a story real quick. So this was in 1991. And I can remember watching a show. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one it was, but it was an interview. I think it was uh, 2020 on ABC, which is their news program, like 60 Minutes. Oh, gosh, I don't even know if it's still on anymore. But a very famous reporter named Barbara Walters was interviewing Barbara Bush. And Barbara Bush was the first lady. And at that moment, George H.W. Bush was incredibly popular. The Gulf War just ended. His popularity was in the 90, or about the, the, the 70%. It would go down to the low, um, low 40s, upper 30s by the next year. But And Barbara Bush was very popular. She just wrote a kid's book about her, their dog and children. You know, a, a book that I'm sure would be a good one for this class. But um, every first lady since Eleanor Roosevelt, compared to Eleanor Roosevelt, who was so dynamic and so influential, and so Barbara Bush was asked about Eleanor Roosevelt. And, since, and Barbara Walters asked, hey, you've been, you've talked about, or people have compared you to Eleanor Roosevelt. And the thing about it is, is that Barbara Bush is from old money. That's, the, the Bush families, they, they're from, um, inherited millions of dollars. And her side of the family, she's a Pierce. And this goes back to Franklin Pierce, former President Pierce. I mean, this is old money. They've inherited money. This is the air. She's a part of the aristocracy. And so to her, comparing her to Eleanor Roosevelt was comparing her to someone who was a traitor to their class. She had been taught from, she was a little girl, that Roosevelt was a horrible person trying to destroy their country. Well, not that small. She was a teenager during the New Deal. And so when Barbara Walters, Walters compared her to Eleanor Roosevelt, she bristled immediately. Like, what? How dare you? And glared at Barbara Walters and said, we do not mention that name. And this was 1991. And it was a softball question. That should give you an idea how much Roosevelt was hated. Ironically, because of the New Deal, uh, companies did pretty good. This is the corporate profit rate. And you can see it going up dramatically from 33 and then really fast after 37, 38. Uh, the war changed profit margins. And here's a funny one of two fat cats. Boo-hoo, the New Deal's ruining the country. And behind it has all these companies making record monies because of the New Deal. Anyways, another important one we have to get to very quickly is Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin was at a time where they had, they called them radio evangelists or radio priests. And this was at a time where, um, and this goes back to the 1920s with the growth of fundamentalism. Radio ministers were going on the radio. They were, um, let me move me, I'm covering up Father Coughlin. This is him speaking in Detroit what, um, at the Tiger Stadium. But they would, these shows were incredibly popular in rural America and encouraging people more fundamentalists, usually pretty conservative. But Father Coughlin at first or he's going to be known as the radio priest, was pretty pro-New Deal. And he was pro-New Deal, pro-Roosevelt, but then it began to shift because he was rapidly anti-communist. Rapidly. Partially because he was a Catholic priest. And communist doctrine is that religion would go away. But as anti-communist, he began to say that Roosevelt was a communist. And Roosevelt's communist ways were trying to destroy the country. And... He became then more and more just simply not just anti-New Deal, but anti-FDR. And he was also intensely anti-Semitic. And this was anti-Jew, saying that Roosevelt was actually secretly part of a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world, part of a Jewish conspiracy to destroy people's lives and destroy religion, and part of a Jewish conspiracy to bring communism. All those things don't really work, um, but... They don't work as a logic, but this was a very racist time, and there was that age-old myth that Jews ran banks. And remember, people don't like banks at this time. And he had a newspaper called Social Justice. That guy is peddling a social justice newspaper where it laid out intense anti-Semitic views. And this might shock you, but he turned out to be pretty pro-fascist and said a lot of very nice things about Adolf Hitler. 
and desperately wanted the United States to stay out of World War II and even indirectly support Nazi Germany. And here, I'll move my picture out of the way. This is a picture in cartoon from Social Justice. And it's showing this horrible caricature of Jews. And this looks like it comes right from Nazi propaganda and with Roosevelt in their pocket. He was incredibly popular until 1941. Well, 42, really. And it fits in with this conservative opposition. Now, very quickly, I had to get to the other enemies of a more liberal opposition. And here, from the left, and a couple ones we have to get here really quick before we get, hey, this took longer than I thought, but I'm almost done. Hey, that's one thing about not having a bell, and you can stop and come back, or listen and come back. It's the great thing about this. But, communist or socialist opposition. All Roosevelt's enemies said he was a communist, but he was trying to save capitalism by putting reforms that would save the basic system of capital being controlled in the hands of those uh, of a few. And therefore, socialists despised him. He's saving it, even though he's using some prescriptions that they follow. And also, communists were very much opposed to Roosevelt not fighting harder for civil rights. And here is the communist platform, and you notice there's an African American. And they're trying to push this idea, the communists were, of civil rights. No, their party did get more members during the Great Depression as an alternative, but it showed how they were pushing for equal rights for all people. And yes, civil rights leaders are going to be called communists. You can find many pictures of Martin Luther King being called a communist. But they didn't like him because of that. But they're ones, I should have put pushed, but they're pushing FDR this whole time. FDR will use the power of the Communist Party to get bills he wants by saying simply, if I don't do it, the Communists will take over. Another one was Dr. Francis Townsend. They create these called Townsend Clubs. And this, and you can see it right there called the Townsend Plan. There's Townsend talking and a, a doctor, um, in his late, late 50s, nondescript, not a great speaking voice, but he pushed for an old age pension of about $200 a month. And this is incredibly hot, incredibly high pension. But the whole idea was is that there was nothing for retirement in the new modern world of capitalism. When people, and this is what they said over and over again, when people are too old to work and too young to die, what happens to them? Most families can't afford to care for their parents. They're working on wages too. And during this bad economic times, they have no money at all. And so most people, when they retired, or a significant number, they had nothing. They went into immediate poverty. The poverty rate amongst the elderly was 80% amongst retirees. They set up these retirement homes. They called them old age homes. And they were literally these stark, awful places where elderly were packed in when they were kicked out of their homes and lost everything. They were fed rice gruel and basically left to die. And this was everybody's fear. By the way, if that's your fear, you'll stay working longer and accept lower wages. So old age pensions increase wages because it gives workers bargaining power. But anyways, he pushed for this very high pension. And this would push FDR helped push him to do Social Security a couple years later. Much, 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 much lower. Just, you know, about $20 a month. But still, a little bit of a retirement plan. It gives you an idea that a lot of people were saying Roosevelt was not doing enough. But nobody was more famous than the kingfish, Huey Long. He was the governor and then senator from, or for, I don't know why I put for, uh, um, sorry about that. Let me move me a little bit. From Louisiana. And he would become basically the boss of Louisiana. He was a Democrat. He was a populist. He pushed for more things for people and also his own personal profit. And he ran the state and thus known as the Kingfish. So the Kingfish. And he created the Share Our Wealth Clubs with this idea that the country is not doing enough. 
And every person, regardless of their income or their jobs, should be able to share in the benefits of American life, not just a few very wealthy. And this really was an effective attack on trickle-down economics. These clubs formed all over, and every man our king became a very seductive slogan. They would cap income at a million dollars and estates at five million. So any income over a million dollars a year, which virtually nobody, just a, a few people made that, it would be taxed at 100%. And so there'd be no income above 1 million. What I mean by that is any income over 1 million. This is marginal. So if you make a million five hundred thousand dollars a year, that $500,000 would be taxed at 100%. That million not taxed at that. But anyways, so no income over a million dollars. And so they would take that money and give everybody $2,000 a year and a homestead of $5,000. Now $2,000 a year. The average income, the median income was about $500 a year. And so this is much bigger than what anybody had. But he's also an effective bargainer. He knew we're not going to get that. But a thousand? You know, this is what he's thinking. And to people starving from the Great Depression, terrified about tomorrow, this really looked like a great program. This would be above your job. So we would call today universal basic income, uh, which is an interesting idea to guarantee everybody, regardless of their job or condition, uh, some kind of paycheck. That's part of the reason why they're giving everybody who makes under $70, $75,000 today, this is a more liberal program, $1,200. Bucks. Um, probably not enough to do a huge amount, but enough to try to make up for the difference in lost demand. It fits in with that universal basic income. And it looked like he looked like he might um, push Roosevelt or in the 1936 election as a third party candidate. He began to say Roosevelt's not doing enough. And it really looked like he might win the presidency. And any vote for Huey Long would be a vote for whomever the Republicans nominated. But in 36, he was assassinated. There was a doctor named, ah, sorry, named Carl Pavey. And he, this actually had nothing to do with, with Long's uh, Share Our Wealth Club. What happened was Pavey's father was denied a, a judgeship and Pavey blamed, blamed Long. And so he assassinated Long just as he was coming out of his gaudy new capital, state capital in Louisiana. If you go to Louisiana, this ugly tower, I should have put a picture in there, but this tower, sorry. And assassinated him. It's one of those great what ifs in history. What if? Huey Long would have lived. Would he have run against a third party? Would we have had President Alf Landon and not had FDR, not only for the rest of the New Deal, but more importantly, his, his work as president during World War II? A what if. But the problem was this. The New Deal, yes, it had some great effect, but was it working? It made things better, but unemployment was still high. And so, with these enemies, now pushed by the left, he would use these, would come with the second New Deal. And this would be the most important part of the New Deal. And the first one, Social Security, and that is where we'll end and I'll finish it tomorrow. Yeah, that took a little bit longer than I thought, but Social Security. Uh, any last minute questions? I am looking right now at uh, the screen. No questions. Remember, this is all up there, so you can look at, well, an hour. Uh, I hope I didn't go too fast. And no questions? Okay. So I'm going to put this up online. I My expectation is you'll know this, etc. I'm also going to get up uh, the short answer questions that we'll have to do on everything we talked about. The problem is I don't know if I can quite get to the New Deal. You know, we lost a week and a half, essentially, uh, various reasons partially my own technical problems, but I think we know what happened last week. And so, if there's no questions, all right, I'm going to try to come on again tomorrow about the same time. Hopefully, YouTube won't go down. I have a feeling a lot of teachers are doing this. And if anybody would like a chat with me or a couple of people that chat with me, um, or individual or a small group, we can do that on Google Teams or on Microsoft Teams. 
I try to do that in special topics and to get too many people it just uh, can't hear <laughs> it's really too hard but Uh, second New Deal, 34 through or 35 and 36, 1934 and, or 1935 and 1936 for the Second New Deal. And so that would be Social Security. It'll be just four laws. And so we'll finish this up tomorrow. Okay, if there's no more questions, I will go. If you have another, another question, this stream, it will still be on as long as I keep the stream window up. So you can stream on this and I'll keep it up for a while longer or stream or ask me on Microsoft Teams and I'm gonna do a little bit of grading and have a bite to eat. All right.